Good afternoon, everyone. And good, um, well, good afternoon, I guess, to both coasts now. Uh, we are happy to have you on our EBM EBFM presentation today. Uh, my name is Katie Rowley. I'm with the NOAA Central Library hosting this on the GoToWebinar platform. Some logistics. If you are having trouble with your audio or with the visual components of this presentation, uh, try logging off the platform and then logging back in. That usually solves most problems. If you are having other issues, uh, please know that this is being recorded and we will be posting it on the library's YouTube channel after the fact. And you can find it there, or if you have to step away, it will uh, it will be recorded, so you know that. And if you um, if you would like to email library.seminars at noaa.gov, we can also try some other troubleshooting. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peg Brady to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Katie. This is Peg Brady from NOAA Fisheries at headquarters. Uh, we are teleworking, obviously, uh, working remotely. Today, we're very lucky to have Patrick Lynch, who is our chief, um, <clears throat> our chief of assessment and monitoring division within NOAA Fisheries at the Office of Science and Technology. And uh, Patrick is going to tell us everything we need to know about stock assessment. Uh, the title of his talk, Advancing Fish Assessments to Support Ecosystem-Based Fishery Management. So we're very, very lucky to have him today. Uh, there's an opportunity for you folks to put questions, uh, post some questions to Patrick. You can do that uh, during the presentation uh, through the chat box, and Katie will recite those questions to him after uh, Patrick's presentation. Uh, if there are lengthier questions, uh, there will be a way to contact Patrick uh, through email if you have a detailed question uh, about any of the items in his presentation. Uh, also, I just want to send a reminder, we do offer the seminar series monthly, the second Wednesday of each month at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And our next seminar is October 14th at uh, 3 p.m. Uh, by Kelly Shotwell from our Alaska Fishery Science Center, who will be spe speaking about ecosystem and socioeconomic profiles for fishery management decision making. So that should be a very interesting topic as well. So. Uh, again, Patrick, thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to your presentation. So we'll turn it over to you, and you'll be able to start presenting from your uh, system. Great. Thank you, Peg. Um, I hope you can see my slides currently. Yes, everything's uh, clear, and okay, we can hear great. you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Excellent, and thanks for the invitation to present here. I'm, I'm actually pretty thrilled uh, to cover this topic. I've spent a fair bit of energy in my career um, thinking about the connection between fish assessments and ecosystem-based fishery management. So I am, I'm glad to be able to do this and thank you to everybody who's signing on um, for listening. Okay, there it goes. Uh, so this first, um, graphic here is to set a little bit of context about what NOAA Fisheries is doing um, to achieve ecosystem-based fishery management. Uh, it's a very high level view, um, but if we start on the left, you see there's this uh, strategic guidance area, ring, if you will, and a number of strategic plans under it, um, denoted by the acronym. So we have Habitat Assessment Improvement Plan, Stock Assessment Improvement Plan, EBFM Roadmap, National Climate Science Strategy. There have been a number of independent reviews of our science programs and a protected resources stock assessment improvement. So these strategic guiding documents are in place to drive the science programs in the agency. And so that's, you know, doing the observing, observations and data collection, um, conducting research, synthesizing the data and the research into um, you know, modeling exercises, all of this to feed into our stock assessments, our integrated ecosystem assessments, which ideally have a, a linkage and a connection, and together that would culminate in advice to managers um, to facilitate EBFM. So now on to my um, outline, uh, the presentation. I was asked to give a little bit of a stock assessment 101. So I'll start with an intro into stock assessments. It's brief, 
it's not in depth in any way, but hopefully it's relatively accessible to folks who have not spent much time thinking about stock assessments, given that the rest of the presentation will be on stock assessments. Um, I'll talk a bit about how we coordinate assessments in our National Office of Science and Technology. Uh, and then the part of the, the presentation I'm particularly excited about is how some of our strategic directions um, connect with ecosystem-based fishery management and the progress we've made in, in recent years. Okay, so introducing stock assessments. Um, they're done really for two purposes. One is a backward looking purpose and one is forward looking. So when we look in the rear view, um, it's intended to measure stock status relative to biological reference points, you know, essentially to determine if a stock is overfished or experiencing overfishing. When we're looking forward, it's about projecting harvest levels to optimize yield and in some cases prevent overfishing, well, in all cases prevent overfishing, in some cases rebuild depleted stocks. So that second step is really about giving catch advice to uh, fishery managers. And there's a process in place for this from data collection, analysis, and reporting. I'll show that process in a, in a graphical representation here. Um, I've been seeing this slide in some webinars lately, so Sorry if it's uh, getting redundant, but um, we're starting with the data collection side on the left. And some of the core elements that go into a stock assessment include uh, data on stock abundance. <clears throat> Often that's collected via our NOAA surveys on NOAA research vessels or chartered fishing vessels. And that info about abundance tells us you know, how the stock has fluctuated over time. That in and of itself isn't a stock assessment, but that's a key input into one. Um, biological data is another important one. That's information, you know, about numerous aspects of fish life history collected through research and also through sampling as well. And it's the biological data that really connects to how productive a stock is. Uh, and Assessments need info on catch because they need to know how the stock responds to removals. So catch itself from the fisheries, all aspects of catch, recreational, um, commercial, subsistence, et cetera, are, are important to account for. So those are kind of the core features of an assessment in terms of data inputs, but there's also room for bringing in socioeconomic information, bringing in ecosystem information, and really anything that may affect how a fish stock or a fishery um, behaves or responds to change. Uh, th this information feeds into a stock assessment modeling exercise, which I'll talk a little bit about in further intro. Um, and those models are, are peer reviewed in different, different flavors for different assessments and, and eventually produce reports that are used as advice to fishery managers on stock status, on harvest policies, and eventually for the purpose of setting catch limits. Okay, so this is a little cartoon representation of a stock assessment. Um, and, you know, we're talking here in the blue box in the middle about a stock size and how you measure stock size. So really there are two main things that make a stock size grow, that's reproduction and growth, individual growth, uh, and two things that make it shrink, uh, removals due to fishing and removals due to natural causes. So in an equation, this is the cartoon equation. Uh, essentially, you're looking at a relationship between biomass in one year and biomass in the next year. And so you pretty much add the uh, inputs and take away the outputs. Um, and of course, each of these terms is more complicated than just a letter. Um, usually, so if we're talking about recruitment, there are a set of sub-functions or sub-components to that. And, you know, simply here, there's the rate at which stock, uh, you know, fish matures, there's fecundity over its life, and um, some relationship between the size of the stock and the number of 
recruits are the amount of reproduction that occurs. And something that will, will be true for most every one of these inputs and outputs is that these subfunctions, these subcomponents, they can vary over time. They do vary over time. Um, and that is an opportunity for more ecosystem type information to enter into the assessment process. So in terms of growth, you know, primarily looking at relationships between length, weight, uh, at age, um, and those certainly also vary over time. As for the removals, in terms of fishing, there's a number of aspects to fishing. That's what's actually landed. Um, and there's discards and the proportion of those discards that survives. Uh, as well as this selectivity term, which is really about the proportion of removal by age or length in the stock. And then natural death is kind of this catch-all natural mortality term um, that can incorporate, you know, it, it implicitly incorporates usually uh, things related to predation and disease and other sources of natural death. Um, but this can be broken out if there's information on those uh, dynamics. Okay, so all those little functions and um, subcomponents are really hypotheses about how a uh, stock behaves, um, how it grows, how it shrinks, and how it responds to fishing. Uh, and so those, those um, assumptions are then compared with the observations that come from our surveys and from our fisheries and from our communities in some cases. Um, and the statistical aspect of stock assessments where the kind of stats expertise is needed is in um, optimizing the function between your assumptions and what you've seen in your observations. So basically you're looking for parameter estimates to tune those functions and best represent the patterns that you see in the data. Okay, so that's configuring the model and, and trying to figure out what, what the best fit is or the best representation of stock and fishery dynamics is. And in some cases, that's more than one model. You may have multiple working hypotheses about that. Um, but you take that model or those models, those fitted models that are selected, and typically are using those to develop a forecast of um, future dynamics. So this is where you use knowledge about the future. Sometimes those can be simplistic assumptions of the future uh, is, you know, the past represents the future. Um, but in other cases, this is a great opportunity for ecosystem-based <coughs> fishery management um, and interdisciplinary work to determine, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> what the future may look like and, um, and how you could project that name. So uh, that, that's the intro, and now we're on to some of the national coordination for stock assessments. In our Office of Science and Technology and in, in the division that, that I work in, uh, we have a national stock assessment program, and that program has a mission statement here. Uh, it's, you know, I don't need to read it, but it's pretty much uh, hopefully what you would expect in terms of leadership and coordination from headquarters office. And that program, the National Stock Assessment Program, is has a very, uh, you know, central and primary strategic driver. And that's a document that was released in 2018, implementing a next generation stock assessment enterprise. And this document is an update to uh, the stock assessment improvement so the figure here, the image, uh, depicts the three main themes of this document, and that's to have assessments be more holistic and ecosystem linked, um, to capitalize on innovation, both in data collection and in modeling, and to establish an assessment process that's more timely, more efficient, and uh, just as effective as it is today, if not more effective. So this is a breakdown of the um, stock assessment program. There are two teams, the administrative team, 
is responsible for tracking and reporting stock assessments at activities at the national level. Um, they support prioritization of stock assessments and uh, identification of needs and gaps within stock assessments. They're doing national coordination across a number of uh, realms, across the regions, across disciplines, and collaborating with you know, ecosystem modelers, economic modelers, um, communicating with our partners, and you know, hosting workshops, conducting reviews, national reviews of the science, and developing technical guidance and recommendations. There's a priority to build capacity and diversity within stock assessment science, and they also seek to develop and train, uh, you know, facilitate training and development of our stock assessment science. And NIC. The modeling team uh, is responsible more for models, as, it, as you would think, and they are hosting national tools that are used uh, by stock assessment scientists and others. They develop national assessment models as well that are intended to be general and widely accessible. Uh, they establish in their own work as well as communicate nationally um, software development and software engineering best practices, provide user support and training to the, to the uh, software they're developing, and facilitate access to high performance computing and cloud resources and other um, computing priorities. Okay, so I'm going to show a couple examples of products that the Stock Assessment Program has developed uh, recently. The first is this web tool called Stock Smart, and it's a transparent way. Um, it provides a transparent access to NIMS uh, stock assessment results to the public. Um, so anybody can go to this website and play with a an intuitive and, a, and I would say modern and innovative design to explore stock assessments. You can see on the right here a couple of you know, quick examples. The lines show um, biomass trends over time you know, and multiple stock comparison of those. And the bars here, this, is, this figure tallies up the number of assessments per year that, that NOAA Fisheries conducts. So you can explore all sorts of uh, assessment results or assessment summaries and visualize, compare and download data um, to get at hopefully what you need for a stock assessment. The team develops all sorts of communications, um, including quarterly stock assessment reports, various web materials and 101s, and fields a number of questions from stakeholders all over, internal to NIMS and, and outside as well. Uh, they, as I said, they conduct and, and host national workshops. So we have this national stock assessment workshop every two years to bring assessment scientists together and work on issues or themes uh, of those workshops. Um, our 2020 workshop was, was to be on spatial modeling and that's been postponed to 2021. Although they are hosting this, a similar webinar series to this in the interim to kind of fill that gap. Um, another workshop, recent workshop, kind of just before the pandemic is a workshop on incorporating socioeconomic information in stock assessment. Uh, Seesaw is the acronym for that. And that, that document or report is hopefully coming pretty soon. I mentioned the tools coordinated by the modeling team and they, they have done a revamp of NOAA Fisheries Toolbox. Um, this is the, the link here and the front page that you would get at. And you can see by the, the tools um, you know, thing in the middle that it's interdisciplinary. It has fish and fisheries protected species, human dimensions, ecosystems, some general tools. So it's it's a place to connect our analytical systems across disciplines. And um, it's a centralized, uh, public, publicly accessible portal. This is kind of how it works. Um, it's all been hosted in GitHub. Uh, so you, you enter the main page, and then from there, you select one of the individual toolboxes, the disciplines, 
once you do that, you're in the GitHub world um, and you can click any, any tool you would want. That'll take you to the page for that tool and these all have kind of standardized views. Um, and if you pick a tool, you have access to the code, to the documentation of the code. If there are executables or cloud-based applications, you can access those as well. So it facilitates this you know, community, open source community approach to uh, modeling. The modeling team also is developing stock assessments itself. This is one example, the Meta Population Assessment System, or MOS. And these developments are in collaboration with scientists in the field, uh, John Brodziak in particular for this one. Um, and you can find this tool on GitHub. It's a, it's a modular, so kind of following the engineering best practices approach, a modular assessment model. Um, and they, they also developed an R interface for running the model. Okay, so that's a, a quick view of what the stock assessment program has been up to, how we coordinate at the national level, um, the intro to assessments, now I'm going to move on to the stock assessment improvement plan as sort of the, uh, the strategic direction for stock assessments um, and, and some of the recommendations in there. And I'm going to provide some highlights of the progress we've made in NOAA Fisheries. So there are seven general recommendations in this plan. Uh, they're listed here. They're you know to provide more routine consideration of ecosystem and socioeconomic drivers, to coordinate the results and the advice across stocks, um, to advance data collection and capitalize on technologies, to advance models and capitalize on developments there, to prioritize stock assessments because no fisheries cannot assess all the stocks that it has a purview over every year, and to improve the timeliness and efficiency of the stock assessment process, as well as to improve communication of the results. So these recommendations are well connected and purposefully so to the other um, strategic plans, particularly the EBFM roadmap. Uh, there's similar authors on both documents as well as climate science strategy and other documents, and that's definitely by design so that this, these uh, plans are well coordinated and, um, and ensure that they're going in the, in the same direction. Okay, so in addition to the, or within, I guess, the seven general recommendations, there are actually 36 specific recommendations within the Stock Assessment Improvement Plan. I'm not gonna go through every one of those, um, but this, this figure here, this chart, uh, it lists all 36 recommendations on, on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, and the bars represent how many science centers of the six have made progress or implemented or responded to the recommendation. So if you have a six, it's a six out of six and everybody's done it. Um, and I think the cool thing to look at here is I don't see any zeros. So every recommendation in the stock assessment improvement plan has had some progress made. Uh, and, and just to quickly look at the themes, if you're looking at the green on the left, those bars are associated with the theme of having more holistic stock assessments. The blue in the middle uh, is related to the innovative science and data collection and modeling. And the purple on the right are related to timeliness and efficiency of the assessment process. So pretty good balance overall. And from here, I'm gonna just go into some highlights. Um, so I've done some you know, queries of partners around the country. This is not in any way a comprehensive analysis of all the activities within NOAA Fisheries. Uh, same with that bar chart I just showed. This is a, a quick set of um, you know, questions distributed to colleagues in each science center and getting their feedback. So we have some good examples. We have the kind of summary totals, um, but there's nuance to all of that, certainly. And I'm capturing this at a national level. So people with 
very close knowledge of these uh, might find some details or have added context that would be useful but i'm i'm here to give the big picture view of our progress and so on this first first recommendation it's related to expanding the scope of stock assessments i'm going to highlight the sable fish assessment in alaska and that assessment is moving to be more spatial more tag integrated and that research and development is actually quite far along um, so when you get this spatial assessment, it'll better support uh, spatial management decision making. And that assessment previously also incorporated uh, whale depredation, so a link to the ecosystem. Um, and it's certainly one of the more interesting stocks and, and holistic assessments out there. I'm also highlighting the summer flounder assessment in the Northeast. Um, I don't believe this assessment has uh, environmental linkages just yet but the re that research is underway basically to identify habitat suitability and, and include that into the assessment um, now we're going to talk about another recommendation and that is to include ecosystem and socioeconomic uh, terms of reference or you know in the terms of reference for a stock assessment the example I'm highlighting here is for gag grouper in the southeast. I, meant, I underline that this is an operational assessment. So operational typically means that you've taken uh, a previous model, you know, that's been accepted and peer reviewed, and you're updating it with new data, uh, with some minor adjustments as needed. And you would see if you were going to expand assessment, you know, to include ecosystem or socioeconomic information, you. That typically happens in a research phase. And these terms of reference, I, I think, is a real positive um, progress is that in the operational assessments, there's still attention to ecosystem and socioeconomic evaluations. And, and as you can see, the quote here to reevaluate potential effects of red tide on gag grouper. And so that's looking in the past as well as to the current year of uh, data or the terminal year of the data. Um, and you can see the figures, you know, these big red tide events cause uh, massive fish kills for gag and other species. And so there's a desire, you know, it's good science and there's a desire by the stakeholders to account for this source of mortality directly in the assessment. Um, here we're highlighting the rec recommendation to have more interdisciplinary communication. So that facilitates the evaluation of ecosystem and socioeconomic drivers. Um, and in the Pacific Islands, they've established what they're calling the EBFM project. And this is pretty cool. This is where they are setting up an interdisciplinary team to kind of go down two paths. One is to look at environmental and ecological drivers and how those drivers are affecting distributions and aggregations of fish species as well as to explore socioeconomic drivers and how those are affecting fisher behavior. So you follow these paths and you bring the information together um, to evaluate how you might, you know, account for that in the stock assessment as well as in management decision making. So a great example of interdisciplinary communication and collaboration. Now on to some of the more in innovative science aspects. This is improving surveys. And um, one, one element of that is to calibrate surveys a bit more so that they can provide absolute abundance estimates where they typically just uh, capture relative change from one year to the next. Also to, to utilize advanced sampling technologies to evaluate sampling designs and to collect ecosystem data you know as more routine on our typical fish surveys i'm going to highlight the the cow cod stock assessment done in the southwest uh, and this one did have a visual survey that estimated absolute abundance this was a single year that this was done and that was incorporated into the assessment uh, and the plan is that they're going to repeat this survey to get a second data point, a second calibration point for absolute abundance. Uh, and then, you know, just kind of a general highlight on advanced technologies, 
is the use of sail drones. There's a picture here of one of the sail drones that provides a, a remote acoustic sampling platform. This is being used around the country now um, you know, to estimate or capture acoustic signatures. Uh, a couple examples are pollock and hake, sardine, anchovy. Also, it's used to measure some oceanographic values as well as uh, you know, evaluating marine mammal prey. Okay, <clears throat> you know, to improve stock assessments, it's also important to improve our industry partnership. Um, you know, in part because they're stakeholders and it in increases stakeholder buy-in, but there's opportunity here um, to, to improve our science, to leverage the opportunity that fishermen are out on the water observing and have you know, are in areas that sometimes we're not able to go to. So working with industries is a, an important way to fill knowledge gaps. Um, and they can do biological sampling. And we can work with industry, with our observer programs and others to find this optimization between observer coverage with humans and, and electronic monitoring and electronic reporting. We've got a couple examples here. Um, from the Pacific Islands Bottom Fish Survey, that survey is done in partnership with the fishing community. And typically, they actually conduct around two thirds of the sampling for the survey. Um, but it's a great safety net when there's a global pandemic. And in this case, in this year, they were able to conduct 100% of the sampling. So this partnership is definitely uh, a benefit to the agency and hopefully a benefit to the fishing community as well. We also have an example of the South Atlantic Deepwater Longline. Similar to many of our surveys, <clears throat> this uses contracted industry vessels. Um, and in this case, though, it's kind of unique that the data are collected by an observer <clears throat> on board the, the industry vessel. So it's a nice partnership between observers, scientists, the industry. Uh, and then on electronic monitoring and electronic reporting, this in recent years has really grown within NOAA fisheries. And now we have pilot or operational programs in all of our regional ecosystems. So a really quick and positive development there. Okay, I think I'm getting close um, to the end of this. Uh, this uh, recommendation is about conducting more process research to expand assessments. I and mean, we've talked about being more holistic and ecosystem linked. And often that's hard to do when you don't always know how the ecosystem is driving fish stock processes or fish stock dynamics. Uh, so research is needed and research is underway. We have an example here of the California Chinook salmon. And um, there's a lot of research going on for that species in particular on how temperature affects its productivity. Um, and already a, a fair bit is known. So this, this temperature, these temperature dynamics can, are integrated into the assessments and the forecasts. Um, so as the research develops, there's already a clear on-ramp within the assessments for incorporating that research. And then in the Southeast, I want to highlight this participatory fisheries system modeling. This seems like a really fruitful development, a little bit similar to the EBFM project in the Pacific Islands. Um, but the idea here is to bring stakeholders, scientists, and managers together in workshops, meetings, to create conceptual models of how the system works. And the purpose there is to identify, you know, should certain factors be brought into the assessment? Are they key drivers of fish stock population dynamics? Of course, uh, mentioned early on, um, having an efficient stock assessment process and effective communication. So we discussed having research and operational assessment tracks 
The idea there is that the operational track can be a bit more streamlined, which allows more time to develop models to be more holistic, to think through some of the processes and the drivers. Um, so you have some time to do research and meet you know, the 21st century needs of managers, of EBFM priorities. Um, <clears throat> so if we have more streamlined assessment processes, then hopefully we can continue to grow and expand. And that's, this has recently been put in place in the Northeast and in the Southeast, and sort of takes on different flavors in some other regions. Um, and I'm glad Peg brought up our, the next speaker in this series, Alay Shotwell, because I'm highlighting her work here. And that is the ecosystem and socioeconomic profiles, which have been a great development for communicating a variety of complex information in a kind of standardized and streamlined way so that management can use the information. Uh, and this is happening in Alaska. I didn't say that. So there is this uh, standard template that connects, connects the ecosystem and the socioeconomic dynamics with fish stocks. Um, pretty comprehensive and thoughtful. Uh, but there's also a kind of simpler two-page summary template that can lie on top of that. Um, and that's to make this information quickly available and easily accessible. So, you know, one page basically has the stock assessment results, the key information that you need to make decisions. And the other page summarizes the ecosystem and socioeconomic aspects. So here we have a really streamlined way for digesting a lot of complex information across the ecosystem, across the communities, in connection with stock assessments um, to, to move toward ecosystem-based fishery management. So I'm looking forward to Clay's uh, presentation. I didn't know I'd be plugging it. It's great to hear. OK. Um, so that's about it for the presentation, but I do want to summarize a little bit. Um, it's impressive and exciting, the progress that's been made uh, since the Stock Assessment Improvement Plan came out, but, but also it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's not, you know, the Stock Assessment Improvement Planning had recommendations in there that are important because people around the country thought they were important to begin with. And so we've We've got this sort of natural progression from the traditional single species uh, stock assessment approach that often is non-stationary in some of its assumptions to a more holistic approach that's a, trying to account for these complex dynamics, uh, where it makes sense and where it's possible. So I enjoyed putting the presentation together because I learned a lot and I'm impressed with the progress and I want to thank all of our science centers and the scientists who've made that possible. I also want to thank uh, my co-editors on the plan, Rick Mathot and Jason Link, both senior scientists for NOAA Fisheries. Had some help with this presentation from Abby Furnish, Melissa Karp, Andy Chan, and uh, a bunch of contributors to the Stock Assessment Improvement Plan from around the country, all listed here on the right. Also hundreds of others. A lot of, you know, this, uh, this plan itself was reviewed far and wide um, and those comments and, and their input was brought into the final version. Also, our office, our agency leadership has been heavily involved in strategic thinking and implementation of strategies. Um, so really, this is a huge community effort. And um, I'm going to close there. You have my email here at the bottom if you have uh, what Peg referred to as kind of more comprehensive questions, but I'm certainly available now as well. Super, super, Patrick. That was wonderful. A great, great insight to the agency's uh, stock assessment and EBFM. Um, so this is an opportunity, as uh, Patrick just uh, highlighted, to uh, query him on any of the items he discussed. And uh, Katie, I'm not sure if you can see any questions coming in. Yes, we do folks. have a few questions. We have a, a great attendance today, up to about 270 folks uh, listening in. So um, a lot of interest out there, Patrick. 
Awesome. So our first question is from Admiral Gallaudet. Uh, great to see the SAIL drone example, Pat. How do you see omics in meeting the data collection recommendation? Great. Thank you for attending. It's really great to have you here and support. And, and I know you're always enthusiastic about the science enterprise, so appreciate that. Um, yeah, omics. And it's, uh, you know, it's been a component of fishery science for a long time. Um, I think maybe there's a lot to omics that, that I'm not capturing, but just thinking about genetics for now, it's kind of fundamental to stock identification. Um, so, so we use that currently to identify stock structure. I mean, a single species is not necessarily one stock. Often there are you know, reproductive units within that species and their genetic relationships are, are key, a key input to figuring out how you would structure and manage an individual stock. So that, without a doubt, is uh, important and I hope we're able to grow in that area. There's a lot of promising options as well, such as some of the uh, close kin um, approaches that help identify abundance and relationships between uh, you know, reproduced individuals and their parents. And so um, great question. And I, I am excited that we've, we've done a lot of genomics already and, and hope to continue to increase and progress in that area. Thank you, Patrick. Our next question, what is the current thinking on how climate change may challenge stock assessment methodologies and processes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's something you know I've put some some research time into, and and are currently working with our climate program on quite a number of initiatives to address this. Um, climate change is really kind of the challenge. I would put it out there with a capital T as the challenge for you know future long-term sustainable fishery management, uh, and. And if we're thinking that the you know, past represents the future, then I don't think we're being well prepared uh, for what's ahead. And so the thinking, I, we have strategies along those lines as well in the agency, um, in a number of the plans. And the network, I think, is addressing this through um, careful collaboration with one another. We have a a couple of recent documents put out on how to integrate climate information into fishery management. Uh, and we can provide references for those. But the key is really, you know, the stationarity assumption uh, and moving away from that. But, but the way to move away from that is very case specific and it's challenging. Um, so it takes a thoughtful group, a group that understands, you know, the physical nature of climate change it understands the biological response and how to how to project that forward in a way that makes sense and holds up over time. So that's the key, it, and that's why it's the challenge. I mean, you know, it's hard to predict the future. I think there was an image, uh, Yogi Berra picture in my um, slides that I think captures that. Thanks for the question. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Our next question um, has multiple parts, so I'm going to break it up a little bit. Recognizing that we always need more data of what we currently collect for EBFM, what new data might we need to be collecting? Or do we just need to innovate uh, sail drones, machine learning, AI, eDNI, eDNA on how we collect current data requirements? Um. Okay, uh, that's a good question. I, you know, thinking on the fly, it's a tough one because I feel like I'm aware of a number of examples where we, we are collecting a lot of data. Sometimes it's piecemeal, uh, a lot of types of data, I should say. Um, and I'm trying to think if there are types that I'm not thinking about that, that we haven't started collecting. We definitely need to expand. There's, uh, you know, data about, the communities about um, human behavior, about economics. And we really need to increase that if we want to work with economists and sociologists on 
how human behavior affects fishing and responses to the economy and all that. Um, that's an area we need to, to increase. Uh, if we're going to think holistically about trade-offs in the ecosystem, we need to be able to build those, those tools, those simulation tools, those ecosystem level models. And of course, those are very data hungry. They can be done in a simple way, but, but the more we capture the real world, the better. Um, and so that's, that's everything under the sun from you know, physical, biological interactions between species, the interactions with fisheries. Uh, so there's a lot of complicated dynamics within an ecosystem, but if we really want to evaluate trade-offs, um, we need to know as much as we can. And for, for single species dynamics, um, I think over time, the stock assessment uh, to management process has been performing quite well. We've really dropped down cases of overfishing dramatically and um, are rebuilding stocks all the time. So the system is, is doing pretty well, um, but referencing the previous uh, comment about climate change, I think we need to be prepared. So we need to be able to do short-term forecasting. We need to know what's gonna happen the next year or two or five so that we can um, you know, be prepared and have management in place that accounts for those dynamics. And I think I'm circling around this question, but I haven't, I honestly haven't thought of uh, while talking a specific type of data that is not currently available that should be available. Great, thank you, Patrick. There was a last question to that one that said, uh, and where do we best need to spend our limited funds? I don't know if you wanna tackle that as well. Yeah, wow. Um, that's a very good and pointed question. Uh, I think we the short answer, and this is potentially not, not the kind of answer you're looking for, but I think the short answer is we need to spend our funds where the priorities are the highest. Um, which means we need to take up exercises uh, within the agency to evaluate, you know, what are our what are our main products, what are our clients want most, and also what do we have in order to develop those products? Um, what types of data do we have in place? What types of research do we need? Um, and I think that's where personally where the resources should be directed, but it's not as simple as just saying, you know this region or this activity or, or this type of data. Uh, so I'm gonna leave it there. Great, thank you, Patrick. Okay, our next question. You mentioned some monitoring that is helping to fill in the gap when surveys have been cut this year due to COVID-19. Are there assessment or management approaches that you recommend that also help deal with this loss of critical survey data? Yeah, um, on the assessment. So, so in the example that there might not be uh, a survey conducted in a given year, I think we can expect from that that the uncertainty around the assessment will increase. Um, there are scientific ways to deal with that. We have a lot of work out of the West Coast, but this is, is going around the country on a, a tool called VAST. You know, I think it's vector autoregressive spatiotemporal. I might I think I have that acronym right by uh, Jim Thorson. And the, the tool is capable of estimating abundance trends and filling in gaps in between years where, uh, where sampling wasn't conducted. Um, so, so that's one tool to help, you know, have data in place where it's lacking. Um, but but the uncertainty is going to increase. So if you're if you're on the management side, then I think you know that will translate into the risk uh, the risk based decision making. Um, and so your risk of overfishing for a given level may be higher when uncertainty is higher than it would be had the um, had the data been collected. So I think in that case you might want to be more precautionary in your management decision-making in response to the increased uncertainty. 
Great, thank you, Patrick. I'm gonna grab a few more questions uh, before the end of the hour. This first one, what are the drawbacks and benefits of having different survey practices for different science centers? And what are your recommendations? Um, drawbacks and benefits of different survey practices. So um, I think there is a, there are a lot of similarities. We have trawl surveys in a number of regions. We have long line surveys. So, so gear-based surveys are, are somewhat consistent, um, but the, the type of gear you use is certainly related to the type of fisheries, the type of species, and the type of um, the features of the ecosystem. You wouldn't want to pull a trawl across uh, a coral reef, for example. Um, so, so I think the advantage of having different types of sampling platforms is that you are, you know, using the sampling approach that's best suited for the environment that you're sampling in. Um, so I think that's an advantage. The the con. Uh, I'm trying to think of one. I mean, it, it requires a bit more resources and coordination to use and understand how different sampling gears work and what the data collected by those platforms means and how it can be incorporated into stock assessments and other disciplines and activities. Um, so perhaps the need for a broader range of expertise is, is the con that I can think of at the moment. Great, thank you, Patrick. We have a follow-up question from Admiral Gallaudet. Alaska's uh, Mark Zimmerman has a great example of partnering with industry for stock assessments called CIRAC, kind of like Ben Richards' uh, Bee Fish. What can senior NOAA leadership do to foster more of that? Um, I did miss a couple of those words, but it, it sounds like, um, what can NOAA Fisheries leadership do to facilitate better partnerships with industry in conducting stock assessments? Is that right? Uh, that sounds about the uh, the gist of it. What can NOAA leadership like Admiral Gallaudet do? Yeah, great. Um, well, partnerships with industry, I think, is, is going to be fundamental for advancing fish assessments. And we've seen that in, you know, the example here in this year where surveys and ships are at the dock, but the fishery is out there. And with good partnerships, with good cooperative research programs in place, um, we can fill that gap by working with industry. Um, so NOAA Fisheries itself, uh, its leadership, I, I hope is, is certainly supportive of that, um, that can, you know, that you and, and they can meet with, with these industry groups uh, to come up with agreements and arrangements. I think that would be well received by industry. I think they really appreciate to have their ideas um, and their voices heard by the federal government and by NOAA and NIMS in particular. Uh, the more we do that, the better science we're able to produce, but also the more efficient and stronger management process we can have in place. Um, so I think, you know, reaching out to industry asking them for their coordination and collaboration. Uh, and in the stock assessment improvement plan, we have the consideration of having them collect data as part of their normal fishing operation. But we can work with them and, and use resources in that way to potentially fill those gaps. And I think the more we reach out and explore the possibilities there, um, we're gonna see a huge benefit. Thanks so much, Patrick. We have about five minutes left in this presentation and I do have one more question. Uh, you mentioned a systems um, slash conceptual, mo conceptual modeling effort going on in the Southeast. Do you know what office is heading that up? Yeah, I would reach out to the Southeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, they provided that example. Um, I'm excited about it, but I certainly have not been involved in it. So I would. I would research, reach out to them. Uh, yeah, and and uh, let me know if you need contacts there. But. 
Great, thank you. Peg, I have reached the end of the current questions unless someone is furiously typing right now. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, just a big thank you to Patrick and to his entire team here on the acknowledgments uh, slide. And of course, uh, Katie to Noah Library, who has always been a strong uh, uh, co-host with us on these series. <clears throat> a remind, excuse me, a reminder that these uh, all these presentations are archived on the NOAA Library website, and so you can see this one as well as others that have been uh, offered on a monthly basis. And uh, again, encourage folks to uh, join us on October 14th, Kelly Shotwell, um, uh, looking at ecosystem and socioeconomic profiles for fishery management decision making. And uh, obviously, Patrick uh, highlighted that in his presentation today. So uh, thanks to Patrick and his team and to everyone who joined us today. Uh, we had a, a great turnout of attendees. So um, thank, thanks to all and be safe and stay healthy. Thank you, everyone. As a reminder, this was recorded, so it will be posted shortly and you can share it. Okay, thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.